Good morning, everybody. Good to be with you. Grab a seat. My name's Carl Beach, or as many people call me, Beachy. Just give me a moment to get organised. And a great job, Christian. A fantastic worship. That's massively uplifting. It's good, isn't it? It was a worship of the Lord together, don't you feel? Good, isn't it? We proclaim in Christ. Um, my life changed, overwhelmingly changed, at the age of 18. And it's amazing how, how life can change on the basis of what seems like one decision at the time. I used to be a salesman. As you can tell from my accent, I'm an Essex boy. Anyone else here from Essex? Four people. I was born in Dagenham, or as we used to call it, Dargenham. To make it sound a little bit nicer. Typical upbringing, uh, nothing special. Dad was a cop, mum was at home, brought us up. And my, my burning ambition for many years was to join the armed forces. And uh, basically, to cut a very long story short, but just so you can get a feel for who I am, at age 18, I saw a girl that I fancied. And I found out she went to church. And we never did church as a family. It just wasn't our thing. And uh, I basically went there to ask her out. And, and I said to her, look, I, I, I actually was a bit arrogant. I said, I think I'll be really good for you. <laughs> and she said, this is what she said, I only go out with Christians. I said, well, I am one. She said, no, I mean I go out with people who met Jesus Christ. I said, I definitely have. She said, no, I mean people are like born again. I said, I'm definitely that. Didn't have a clue what she was talking about. Anyway, long story short, about to join the World Tank Regiment, and six months later, I'm listening to a man called Robert Scott, who was an ex-paratrooper who had become a Methodist minister, and he preached the message of Jesus Christ, and I found myself standing up in response to a gospel appeal. I made a decision, and he massively intercepted my life on the 22nd of April, 1990, and everything changed. In fact, after I was, it was a little brethren chapel, actually, and there were two elders called Ron. One was called Ron Aldridge, one was called Ron Blows, one was tall, one was short. And uh, they came over to me. They sort of floated over like elders of churches do at the end of the meeting to quiz where I stood up. And they took me into a little back room. And um, they said, why, young man, they're a bit posh to me, young man, why did you stand up? I said, I don't know. And they said, well, we don't know either. So we'll talk to you another week. I thought, well, no, I failed the entrance test. I won, 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 come back. And the two ones came back in there. And, and this is honestly, it was a moment of spiritual revelation. I said, I don't know anything. In fact, I probably said at the time, I don't know nothing. That's why I spoke. I don't know nothing, Ronnie. I said, but what I do know is that Jesus Christ died for me and rose again. And these two boys pulled me out of a chair and started hugging me and crying. And then they led me out and they said, Carl was lost and now he's found. I thought, I'm in Orn Church. I don't know what you mean. But the girl that I fancied came over and gave me a kiss. I thought I should have done that six months ago. What's that all about? <laughs> anyway, cut a very, very long story short. I stood outside the church that night and there was, a, there was an old dying bush. It's actually a shrub, but I ripped my top lip off in a cycle crash, crash and I can't say that word properly. There was a shrub like a bush and it was dying and I'm standing next to my best mate Bigsy and I'm weeping I'm an 18 year old kid born in Dagenham grew up in Romford and I'm crying and boys in that upbringing you don't cry and I'm weeping and I'm weeping like a man cries I'm making noises and it's messy and my mate Bigsy says what are you crying for and I went it's green he said what do you mean I said the bush shrub it's green and everything. And he went, I don't know what you mean. i tell you what it was like. It was like stepping out of a black and white picture into a full HD colour picture. Because I saw the world that God had made for the first time. And you can decide for that. You can have the veil lifted off your eyes and put your trust in Christ. And the veil comes off your eyes and you see the world completely differently. I drove home that night and I'm looking at people, fat people, thin people, black people, white people, and I'm weeping. I used to think that people were targets. Now I'm like, these are God's kids and he loves them and I've got to tell people. I didn't know there was a thing called an evangelist. I thought if this thing is real, 
what we call the good news of Jesus Christ. How can you not share it? You've got to get out there. You've got to share it. So the uh, next morning, I got my dad was an undercover cop. He's a tough guy. And I got up the next morning, I'm like, Dad, I'm not joining the British Army now because I'm fighting battles for Jesus instead. And he, he didn't even look up from the firing pan. He went, you still fancy girls, don't you, son? That's the main thing. And completely nailed me. It was a bit of a moment. But that decision changed my life. Changed my life. It didn't just change my life, it changed my destiny. And I didn't, I didn't go in the army, I, I went to a bank in the city, and then I left that and I went on to plant churches on council estates. And as you heard earlier, I'm leader of Redeemer King Church. There's at least two people here. Redeemer King? Maybe three. Good shout out, you should project a little bit harder than that. So I'm a senior leader of Redeemer King, and I'm president of an amazing organisation called Christian Vision for Men. Any boys here from CVM boys? Happy days, been to the gathering and stuff. And uh, also I'm chief exec of a ministry called The Edge, which is going after the most hurting, lost and broken people across the UK for a whole bunch of stuff that we're doing. But this is what I've realised, and there's a reason why I do that. This book, God's Holy Word, is absolutely dripping with the presence of God. And when you read it, and you absorb it, and you get it from here, and you get it into your heart, it changes the game. And every single word has a purpose. Now, as you've been reading Hebrews in the morning, it may sound a little bit complicated. Hebrews is a complicated book. But actually, it's telling a story, like the whole of this book, of an epic and absolutely remarkable story of rescue and redemption. Telling us that no life is written off. There is hope for everybody. No situation can't be transformed and all we need to do is decide for Jesus and everything changes. So I'm going to read to you from Hebrews 2, 9 to 15 and then we're going to uh, unpack a couple of key points. Here it is, Hebrews 2, 9 to 15. But we do see Jesus made lower than the angels for a short time so that by God's grace he might taste death for everyone, crowned with glory and honour, because he suffered death. For in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, and that is God's plan, that he brings you to glory. You are his children who he loves. It was entirely appropriate that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, should make the source of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will sing hymns to you in the congregation. Again I'll trust in him, and again here I am with the children God gave me. Now since the children have flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shared in these so that through his death, and this is a juggernaut of a verse, through his death he might destroy the one holding the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who are held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. Several key things to extrapolate from this. Number one, whether you believe in Jesus Christ this morning or not, whether you believe that there is a God who made the heavens and the earth, which I do with all my heart, and made you, and knows everything about you, and knows every hair on your head, or lack of, he knows every word on your tongue, he knows everything about you, whether you believe it or not, the Bible says that one day, every knee will bow to Jesus Christ. Every knee. Every knee will bow. He has the name above every name. My first and major point is this. Jesus Christ is the highest authority in the universe. The highest authority. That does deserve a shout of praise from someone. He is the highest authority in the universe. Every knee will bow. He made everything. Let, I, I tell you, I had a profound encounter once when I was flogging insurance in London. I had a client come in. And I said, what do you do for a living? She said, 
I'm a medium. I'm like, that's an interesting one. How do I witness to a medium? So I said to her, interesting, I'm a committed follower of Jesus Christ. She said, oh. And uh, we sort of stopped talking about it for a moment, a little frosty silence. Got a cup of coffee. I find that a great British solution to moments of stress is I put the kettle on. Have you found that? It's a little tip there, especially if you're a pastor. I'll put the kettle on. When I came back, I had a little bit of wisdom from the Holy Spirit. And I said this. When you leave here, and before our next meeting, I want you to ask a question. Ask your spirit guides. I said, you got any? Got a spirit guide? She said, I've got three. Quite a bit greedy, personally. I said, ask them who's in charge on the other side. Thought it was worth a punt, didn't it? <laughs> she didn't come back to her second meeting. And I saw her in the banking hall a month later, and I went up to her, beachy style. <laughs> I said, you didn't turn up to your last meeting. She went, oh, a bit sheepish. I said, you asked a question? She said, I did. I said, what was the answer? And she sort of looked down for a minute. And she said, well, I asked my spirit guides, and they said two things. So the first thing they said was, so who's in charge on the other side? And they came to me, and they said, the Christ is in charge. The Christ is in charge on the other side. I said, wow. What was the second thing they said? Well, I didn't come to the meeting because they said, they said, if you keep talking to that bloke in the bank, we won't talk to you anymore. And that's how I earn my living. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a war on. I hope you realise that. But the highest authority in the universe is Jesus Christ. And he has power beyond our comprehension. We can't even begin to conceive the scale of it. Even his name has power. In Acts 19, there's an amazing incident where these chief priests had caught on that the name of Jesus has cosmic authority. So they were going around driving out demons, the Bible says. And they would say, in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches, who is a great Christian leader, in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches, come out of this person to the demons. And one day they go to a person who's powerfully demonized, and it says, the demon said back, well, hold on a minute, I'm going to do the Essex version here. Hold on a minute, my old mate. I know who Paul is, the apostle, and I know who Jesus is, but who are you? And give him a kick in. But I tell you what that tells me. The name of Jesus Christ is known in heaven and hell. And your names, if you're a follower of Jesus, are known in heaven and hell. They knew who Paul the apostle was as a follower of Jesus. The question is what we're known for, but that's another matter for another time. But Jesus has power beyond comprehension. If you had more power than any conceivable authority, if you had more power than any cartoon superhero, what would you do with it? You know, people talk about, you know, their dinner parties, what superpower would you want? Well, that's what my dinner parties are like, anyway. <laughs> oh, I'd like to fly. Oh, I'd be invisible. But do you know what Jesus did? It says it. Jesus had ultimate authority and he laid his life down. He suffered death. Of course, it didn't stop there, but we'll come on to that. I've got a picture to show you. Hopefully, it'll come up of the Eagle Nebula. Uh, hopefully, it'll come up on the screen. I can't tell if it is or not from here. Can you see it? Well, it should come up in a minute. There's a picture that they've got in Q Branch out the back of a thing called the Eagle Nebula. And the Hubble telescope uh, discovered it a few years ago. When, it's come at, when it comes up, put your thumbs up so I can tell. If not, let me paint a beautiful picture for you. I've actually painted this and I've got it in my living room. The Eagle Nebula contains something called the Pillars of Creation. And they're huge clouds of gases. In fact, they're so big that stars are born in them. They're 40 trillion kilometers long 
50 trillion miles wide. And if we get the picture up eventually, maybe not, but at the top of these huge pillars that you can get photos of, look it up later, the pillars of creation, there are tiny little wispy bits right at the top, tiny, tiny little flecks. And each of those flecks is bigger than our solar system. And the Bible says that God made it through Jesus. He has ultimate authority, and yet the Bible says that he allowed himself to suffer and be beaten to a pulp, nailed to a cross. In fact, Matthew 26, 53. Come on, can you see it? It's beautiful. You see the little tiny wispy bits at the top? They're bigger than our solar system. Those huge clouds of gas are 50 trillion miles high, and the Bible says that God made it. He has more authority than you can comprehend, but here's what the Bible says. When Jesus died on the cross. He had power and authority to call down, the Bible says, 12 legions of angels. One legion of angels is 6,000. That's 72,000 angels could have cut him down from the cross and rescued him. In case you're thinking now that angels are kind of wispy things with fluttery sparrow feathers, they're not. In Isaiah and in the Psalms, they tell us that one angel struck down 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. 72,000 angels had more firepower than all the armies of all the soldiers in all the world. That's how much authority Jesus had. And do you know what he chose to do? He chose to suffer and die for you. He went all the way through. If I had superhero powers, I don't think I'd do it. I think I'm going to get some of those angels down. But not Christ. Why? Because you are loved. You are loved to a depth you cannot even begin to conceive. You are loved so much that you had a saviour who chose to die and suffer. The, the Bible speaks and Christians often speak about sin. A little word. We know it more now because of Weight Watchers. <laughs> but we know it for S-I-N or S-Y-N. It's basically doing as you please and living to your own rules. And Let me tell you something. Your sin, living to your own rules, it takes you to places you don't want to go. And it hurts you. It will take you down dark paths. There will be people here now on the edge of all kinds of stuff and struggling in all kinds of ways. And the God of the universe, who made the Eagle Nebula and sent his son to die and could have had him cut down by 72,000 angels. He's whispering to us, He's whispering to you now, don't go that way. Turn to me. Turn to me and I'll change everything. Don't go that way. The cross is one of the most oh, cosmic example, the most cosmic example of love we can ever imagine. And all the Bible says is, Decide for Christ and make a U-turn and stop living for yourself and live for God. And that's why I suffered and died. And he writes no one off. I remember, <laughs> I remember once, some years ago, a door knocking when I was planting a church on a council estate. Now, you're not going to believe this because I'm standing up here, but I'm actually a little bit shy. <laughs> I am. I only do this because God's called me to it. If I had my way, I'd be a long-distance lorry driver. I love that. In my truck, listening to a bit of tunes. But the Lord called me to do this, so I do it out of obedience. But I remember door knocking, and I don't like it, but I was like, oh. Anyway, it was Colville Muse, number five, Colville Muse, planting in a church on a very desperate estate. It's a very desperate road, very poor. And I knocked on the door, and this woman opened the door. Now, some of you who were born around my era, the 70s, will remember this. I knocked on the door, and a woman opened it, and she was she was big, muscly woman, big. Looked like Big Daddy the wrestler. <laughs> and she had a hair wall slick back. He said, Who are you? I mean, my name's Beachy, I'm like an undercover vicar. So I don't wear a dog collar, never had one. And uh, don't even know where to get one. And um, 
She said, I don't want some bloke in a dress telling me how to live my life. And politely asked me to remove my presents. <laughs> and um, I'm like, oh, now I'm shy, so I'm like, my heart's up, and I don't like that. Anyway, I'm walking down the road, I'm, I'm leaving it, and my mates start laughing at me. So I got ripped into. And as I'm walking down the road, this little voice inside says, knock on the door again. I'm like, oh, no. And I'm like, no, nah, that's not God, that's the cheese. Right, uh. And then he's saying, knock on the door again, knock on the door again, knock on the door I'm like, no, I don't want to do it. Anyway, I'm like, man up, took a deep breath, knocked on the door. And she basically, you'd have to interpret this, she basically said something like, I've told you once, I've told you twice, do please leave. And uh, so I'm like, oh, okay, good. Anyway, two weeks later, I'm walking back down Colville Mews. Little voice says, knock on number five again. <laughs> I'm like, if that's you, Lord, I'm like, oh, come on. He's like, knock on number five. Look, I'm ignoring it. And eventually, this little whisper, it wasn't audible, it's like in my heart. This little thing's growing to a sound. It's like, knock on number five. <laughs> so I knocked on the door, and, and this lady, whose name is Sue, answered the door, and she said, oh, it's you. Come on in, love. So, uh, I'll never forget this. I went in, and our house was bare. No carpet, messy, bare, poor. And her kid was sitting in a corner rolling a spliff, cannabis joint. Sat down in his old chair. She said, do you want a cup of tea? I said, I love a cup of tea. Made me a cup of tea. Passed me, I'll never forget this. This is why I'll never forget this. She passed me a tea, I went, can I have a couple of sugars in that? She went, that's very bad for you, you know. I'm like... <laughs> bizarrest moment of my life. And then she said this. I said, bit of an incident the other week. And she said, well, there's a thing. I won't tell you why, because the kids are here. But she said, I was going to kill myself that day. And I had loads of vodka and pills upstairs in my bedroom. And you knocked on the door and broke the moment. I've been building up courage all morning. And you knocked on the door and you broke it and I was furious. I said, yeah, I could tell that. <laughs> and she said, I prayed a prayer. Never been to church. But something in me asked me to pray a prayer. And I said, God, if you're real, you'll make that idiot knock on the door again. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. Beautiful rescue. She gave her life to Christ there in the living room. She became a lollipop lady, actually. She used to be a debt collector. Became a lollipop lady. Seen the school and the community centre where we used to live. The church grew alarmingly because she had a fearsome reputation. She'd go, do you go to Queen's Park Church? Because you should. <laughs> we had a, quite a steady rate of uh, new disciples, thanks to Sue. <laughs> he brings sons and daughters to glory. He defeats the power of death and the devil. No one is beyond hope. No situation can take away the possibility of a destiny and an eternity with Jesus Christ and life to the full right now. He reaches out to all people, even in the scum his house, in the most desperate situation, he reached in and rescued that woman. And even today it brings me to the edge of tears, seeing the beautiful things that he did in Sue's life. And I've seen it time and time and time again. Let me tell you, sin takes you to places you don't want to go. But when we commit our life to Christ, it transforms the game. And this is how, because he didn't stay dead, Jesus Christ. The Bible says that he died on a cross and three days later he rose again. And he defeated the power of darkness and the devil and overcame the forces of Satan. 
once and for all. A howl came out from hell. The moment Jesus died and the tomb, the stone of the tomb was rolled away. And from that moment on, thousands and thousands and millions of people have found new hope and destiny and future and life in Jesus Christ. It's all we have. It's all we got. It's all I talk about. I'm a total one-trick pony. All we got is Jesus Christ. I'll boast in nothing else, the Bible says. Paul says, I'll boast in nothing but the cross of my Saviour, Jesus Christ. Because he changes the game. Jesus said he is the bread of life. So many people are looking for the itch to be scratched and turn into all kinds of things. Smoke a spliff, workaholic, take up golf. Golf! <laughs> only Jesus Christ can satisfy. And only Jesus Christ can make you the man or woman that you know you ought to be, everybody. Only he can take you there. Do you believe it? Only Jesus Christ can make you the man or woman. You know deep in your heart you ought to be. And there will be people here this morning who have not yet decided for Jesus Christ. He will totally change the game. I remember being in Northern Ireland and sitting with an ex-IRA terrorist next to an ex-policeman from the URC. Used to, they said we used to hunt each other on the streets of Belfast. Do you know what they're doing now? They're on the men's breakfast committee. How does that even happen? How does that happen? There's only one who can make it happen. His name's Jesus Christ. I've got another mate who was a Nazi terrorist, arrested at gunpoint, planting a pipe bomb, a man of hate and violence. He came to Christ that curry night and now teaches reconciliation in schools. An ex-Nazi, the first person he led to Christ was a nominal Jew. On the Holocaust Memorial Day, he preached peace and reconciliation to 1,500 school kids. Only Jesus can do that, right? No, no program or administrative process can do that. I could tell you story after story after story. And here's what the Bible says, that the devil had a plan to destroy your life. But there is a way to find a wholeness and peace and completeness. Life is tough. It is a roller coaster ride. Many people have a life plan. Any of you here wrote out a life plan? A list of things you wanted to accomplish? I had a long list of things I wanted to accomplish. Own a Ferrari, fly a plane. I had an old Ford Escort once. <laughs> this didn't quite work out, because here's the thing. Mike Tyson once said this. To quote the great Mike Tyson at a Christian festival. Everyone has a fight plan until they're punched in the face. <laughs> you can have a plan for your life until the wheels come off and things start to go wrong. Life does that. And people here struggling with all kinds of things. All kinds of issues and hurts and pain and dreams that weren't fulfilled and looking back with regrets or things have failed. The Bible says, we give our life to Christ, the game changes. But it's not just for life now, this is for eternity, everybody. The decision you make for Jesus affects where you are, not just now, but where you are a thousand years from now. Because the Bible says, we don't just die. We die and we face Jesus Christ. And we have to decide. There's good news and bad news in the Bible. The good news is we choose Christ, we live, and Jesus satisfies our souls and we get to be with him for eternity. And verse 15 says it all. We're in slavery to the fear of death. We bury our heads in the sand of, of the fact that you and we are all going to die. Way! <laughs> you are going to die. I remember both my daughters being born. I was there. Cut the cord and everything. That's a big pair of shears. Wasn't expecting that. And I held them in my arms. And I looked at their little faces. And I was overcome by love. I cannot even begin to describe. Your God in heaven, your Father in heaven loves you even more than that. But I was holding my daughters. And I've thought about this a lot. I put a lot of energy into them. 
They're the most precious things in my life. My wife, my two daughters. They're beautiful, blonde, intelligent. Boys like them, so I've got a couple of shotguns and a German Shepherd. Very important. <laughs> and I poured life into my daughters and I watched them grow. But is that all there is, this life? Are they just going to be a faded photograph in a box one day? What's the point if that's it? People bury their heads in the sand over the fact they're going to die. The Bible says it in Hebrews 2.15. Slavery to it. And so we try and fulfill our lives in other things. The trajectory of my life would have been join the army, go into banking, take up golf, buy a holiday home in Spain and die. I don't even know the name of my great granddad. I'm in awe when I go to rich people's homes and they have the family tree. I don't even know who my great granddad is. On one side, my mum's side, there are Irish publicans. On the other side, there are Hungarian Jews. It's an interesting mix. We had the poorest jobs in peacetime and the lowest ranks in wartime, my family. I don't know who they are. I don't know anything about them. Is that all we are? Just forgotten? A whisper on the footnote of history? No. The Bible says when we choose for Christ, you are remembered forever and you are loved for eternity. You have fullness of life now and you have an eternal destiny waiting for you with your Father in heaven. And let me say it again. Jesus Christ destroyed the power of death and the power of Satan when he died on the cross. When we say that, we should be cheering from the bottom of our hearts because he destroyed the power of death. We live forever. That should be the cry of victory that wells up inside us whenever we proclaim it. We are so British. <laughs> Jesus died and rose again. We're like, oh, jolly good. One for the boys. <laughs> yeah, marvelous call. Yeah. Superb. Let me say it again. In case you didn't get it, God can transform any life. He writes no one off. He died to bring his sons and daughters to glory and defeat the power of darkness. No one is beyond redemption. There is no situation that you are carrying today that can't be fixed. No one here is written off. There will be men and women here, and some of you are now going to feel under pressure as I bring this to land, cheating on their husbands and wives or thinking about it, marriage in tatters, wrestling with hidden addictions, stressed out we work, feeling failures, beaten up by life, health worries, you're worried about death, you might be diagnosed with cancer or some other horrific thing, you might be consumed with worries about debt and you can't see a way through, there might be hidden stuff that no, one's, no one even knows about, you might have had a go at something and you've been duffed up and stressed out, you may be suffering grief and bereavement, fear, self-doubt, a crisis of confidence or just plain hurting or feel like you've been put on a shelf, or your life has no purpose anymore. I meet people who are in these things and feel these things all the time. That is the work of Satan. Putting your head down, trying to stop you from feeling that there is life. And the Holy Spirit, God's precious Holy Spirit, is calling out to you today to lift your head up and see that your life can be utterly, totally, magnificently transformed. By the power of Jesus. You are not a whisper on the footnote of history. You have the potential to be God's sons and daughters, whether you know it or not. And only Christ can do that. doesn't matter how young or old you are. He will make a way through. And all we need to do is decide and make a step towards Jesus. It's all we need to do. He is calling his sons and daughters to glory. He wants to proclaim the freedom from the fear of death and victory in this life and the next over you this morning. So in the last few minutes that I've got, I cannot not do this. Whether anyone responds to this or not, I have to be obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ and give you a chance to decide for life in all its fullness. You may be someone who has sat on the fence for Christ. You may be someone who everyone thinks he's a follower of Jesus, but you know in your heart you haven't. You may have once decided for Christ, but it's gone cold. And you need to get back on track with Jesus in a very profound and definite way. So I'm going to ask you to be bold and put some teeth on this. I'm going to ask you in just a moment 
to come forward and kneel at the front. If you want to decide for Jesus in any of those things I just said, I want you to run forward or walk forward. And don't worry about the crowds because there is a massive crowd in heaven who will be cheering over you. And the crowd here will cheer and clap as you come to Christ. Is there anyone here who wants to decide for Jesus now? You come to the front.